Um, and thank you very much to West Cork Literature Festival and to Emer O'Hurley and Sarah O'Donovan who have done uh, the lion's share of the work in, in making this happen and allowing me the opportunity to meet one of my all-time heroes. Oh, shut up. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm now going to get to grill the one and only Graham Norton. Graham, <laughs> as you know, is no stranger to us Cork, having grown up in Bandon, but spends most of the summers here when he's not working uh, on his TV show and radio show in the UK. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce actor, comedian, broadcaster, entertainer, Irish dancer, <laughs> and most importantly for today's context, reader and writer, Graeme Norton. Hey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Relax. I know, the horrible bit's it's over fine. now. Okay, we're done. <laughs> like, no, it's not horrible for you. You don't have to interview the world's best interviewer. <laughs> no, but I was thinking, because I've interviewed you, yeah. and now as you're interviewing me, you'll be thinking, God, he is very bad. <laughs> you'll be thinking, these questions are brilliant. Why didn't he ask me these? So, uh, yeah. No, I don't think so. It's not a competition. Okay. And you win anyway. <laughs> so uh, let's start with Graham. The writer, uh, you 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 first wrote uh, two books of memoir and autobiography, and I was wondering, um, first of all, were you approached to write those by a publisher, or did you come up with the idea initially? Uh, no, I was approached. the The first uh, autobiography I did when I was around forty, um, and uh, yeah, they just uh, they kept sort of, uh, you know, offering me money to write an autobiography. And I didn't know if I could write a book. Um, but Did they offer you a ghostwriter to do it for you? I'm not sure. I'm sure it must have been mentioned somewhere along the line. But it's a combination, isn't it, of laziness and greed. You know, you would be <laughs> lazy enough to get a ghostwriter, but too greedy to give them any money. Yes. So uh, it felt... it felt. Uh, so that's really why I kind of thought... No. And also, I kind of thought, if I'm going to say I've written a book, I want to have written the book. Particularly because, you know, you've got to do this bit. You've got to go out and promote a book. And if you can't really defend every word in it or believe in every word in it, then that's such a difficult thing to have to do. Um, but yeah, I do remember they they really uh, kind of wooed me to write that first uh, autobiography. So me. So me. And, and it was all kind of a disaster, really, because they, they wooed me and then I finally said yes and they paid me this money. But they knew when I when I did the thing that I was stopping my show on Channel 4 and that I was going off to America to try to do a show there. So I wouldn't be on British television for over a year, I think. Uh, and that's when they published that book, when there was zero wow. interest in me at all. Uh, so uh, it was a bit of a hard sell, <laughs> that book. Uh, but then I did the... But it the did really well. Mm? I mean, it did really well. It topped the bestsellers. And did it? Yes, it did. I don't think... It did as don't well as so they, they hoped. It was. I know. I don't think it did as well as they thought it was going to do. Uh, but then the memoir, the memoir was really, I, I had no interest in writing another. You know, because they, they wanted me to write another autobiography, and I thought, well, I just did that. <laughs> I've only, it's only ten years ago. Not that much has happened. And uh, but then I had this idea of, oh, hang on, if I write a memoir and find some way of writing that, if I get a two book deal then they might let me write a novel because, ah. uh, because no one was going to take just a novel. That What they wanted was the memoir because they knew what that was. They knew it could sell, it had commercial possibilities. But they didn't know anything about the novel. I didn't know anything about the novel. I just, I fancied, I, you know, I'd always wanted to write one. So uh, I got at this two book deal and in the beginning they start you know they were saying oh and, and a novel a comic novel from uh, Graham Norton and then they got a few chapters of it and they were like the darkly comic novel from Graham Norton <laughs> and then by the time they got the whole book they were just like it's a novel by Graham Norton there you go <laughs> see what you think uh, so uh, it was really kind of uh, ballsy and brave of them to to do it in a way because they really didn't know what they were getting. But I think it was ballsy and brave of you to commit to writing a novel without ever having written a novel. Well, you have to write. I mean, I suppose the, the odd thing, and it sounds kind of childish and pathetic, but the, having written an autobiography, the, the act of having written a book, of having actually got that many words down and organised and, and published, 
oddly does give you some confidence. That's what I was wondering, actually. Do, did the writing of the autobiography, did that stir in you the, the, the need to, to create your own world, to create a different world, to create a fictional world? Well, it, it, I think what had happened was I, want, I knew I wanted to do something around writing. And I thought what I might do was um, adapt something for TV. Okay. And so it was, uh, and I approached, there was one book I particularly wanted to adapt. Can but you I, say what it is? Hmm? Can you say what it is? I guess I can, yeah. It's a book called Misfortune. If you ever come across it, it's by Wesley Stace. And it's fabulous. It's a great big kind of Dickensian uh, plot twisty it's a great story and would make a great TV show or series. Um, but I never said that it was me who wanted to get the rights. Okay. So they didn't sell me the rights. So I didn't have the rights. Oh, so, right. And I sort of thought, well, I do it anyway, just on spec. And I thought that seems like a waste of time. So uh, <laughs> I, I didn't do that. And then this idea of, ooh, why don't I write a book uh, sort of started formulating in a more concrete way. Whereas it had been all, you know, it, I think we all, yeah, we all kind of think, oh, I have a novel in me, or I, I'd like to write a novel. But to actually do it, that was when the idea kind of gelled. And w where did the idea for Holden come from? Where did, like, did you start with the character of Sergeant Collins or the village or the scenario or the body? Like, where, what came first? What came first, and it was supposed to be kind of the central image of the book, and it never was in the end, was the house, the, the Burke's farm. Okay. Uh, that was all overgrown and everything was in it. And it's uh, a, a story my mother told me. We were out for a walk and it was a lovely sunny day and I just saw a glint in all this greenery. And I thought, what's that? And then I realised, oh, it's, it's the sun reflecting off Before glass. And you thought, well, there's a house in there. And when you stood back, you could sort of see the shape of a house, but completely overtaken by nature. And there was this story about uh, a farmer in the house, and he had uh, a housekeeper, and, but like, clearly more than a housekeeper, and everyone just assumed eventually he would marry her. And then she was at home, and she read the engagement notice in the paper for him and someone else who had land. And so I initially had this idea of writing a sort of bleak romance, a kind of, you know, that sort of thing. And then I thought, I'm not sure I know how to do that. So that's when I thought, oh, I'll just kill someone. And once there's a, <laughs> once there's a body, then you have a, you have a formula. You know, you yeah. know, you discover a body. Halfway through, you discover another body. Uh, the detective ends up in a life-threatening situation. Ba boom um, So that kind of gave me the confidence of, of kind of managing the story and how it was going to look as a novel, what the shape was. But what I discovered writing is, was that actually it was all the other stuff I enjoyed more. Yes. I enjoyed the, I did enjoy the kind of the bleak romance, the sad lives, the... It was well, so masterfully done, I have to say. It was so brilliantly done, so assured for our first novel. But I did notice that Sergeant Collins, the central character in that book, he, he has no confidence at the beginning. And he, he's, he's always saying, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I, don't, like, I don't know if I'm going to get away with this. I don't know what the locals think of me. And I was wondering, is that reflecting Graham as a writer <laughs> saying, I don't know how people are going to react to me writing a book? Or like, it, was, it, it almost seems so close to how you would feel, or certainly how I felt writing a first novel. Like, have I any right to do this at all? Well, it's Did you feel I mean, that? I hadn't struck, that hadn't struck me before. You're absolutely right. Because it was a way, Sergeant Collins was a, was a way of me writing a male character. Yeah. And, and so, it, because, you know, growing up, I always felt like the outsider was finding ways of making PJ an outsider. And so being a guard not from the area made him an outsider. Uh, because he's larger, he's self-conscious about his weight, that made him an outsider, slightly didn't engage with the community. And so that was how I kind of thought I can get away with writing this kind of straight man in this book. Do you know what I loved the most about the book was the fact that he's a very overweight guard 
um, throughout the book. And like, he has no confidence. And by the end of the book, he has all the confidence and he has won the respect of the village. And he is going off to greater things. And he has a woman and he hasn't lost the weight. I just thought yeah. that was so no. cool. And that was a real decision. That was not going to be his arc. Losing weight was not going to be his arc. Oh, thank uh, God. Because I just thought, I just thought, no. That, no, you that, were so right. That didn't need to be You were so that right didn't to do that. Thing. But it's really that thing you say about confidence writing a, a book. The, I was so... I was most nervous about what people in Ireland would think of that book. Right. Because I, that was the thing I kind of like, you know, I felt like I knew here. I grew up here. I spent a lot of time here, but I don't live here. And I haven't lived here for, you know, 30 years. And I just thought, oh, if I get this wrong, it's like, you know, Ireland will let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I will be alerted to the fact. And, and so the fact that Holding did so well here... Like, I was so delighted by that. That meant more than anything else. Oh, I think you totally nailed but that I, small I did town get, thing. I did get one tweet from a woman, and it, oh, I was so annoyed with myself. Because uh, at the beginning of the book, it's describing a shop, the little shop, a Driscoll shop. And uh, I'm describing the kind of a terrible old veg rack that's there. And I, I think I mentioned a, a limp spring onion. And this woman went, it's a scallion. <laughs> 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 So furious with myself. Okay. Um, I want to talk about Home Stretch, oh, yeah. your most uh, recent novel. Because <coughs> um, it, it definitely seems like it's the, ter it's the third novel. The Keeper came in between. The Keeper is really dark. It's really odd. dark. <laughs> but um, uh, Home Stretch definitely seems more personal from you and your journey. And I also think it moves you slightly away from the world of crime fiction and more towards accessible literary fiction. Um, it's, it's, it's like your writing has improved so much over the course of three novels. It's astonishing. Like the turn of phrase in Home Stretch is really much more literary than the other books. Are you aware of that move? Or I mean, you... It's always so weird, isn't it? The, the labels people put on yeah. things. We've talked about this, yeah. the idea of you know, popular fiction, literary fiction. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me popular fiction is just literary fiction with a plot, isn't it? Exactly. That's, it's that just, was my, that it's... Was my thing. More towards the world of accessibly, <laughs> accessible literary fiction, but with a plot yeah. in capital letters. I have it because, you know, we've got... I mean, yeah. plot, I think... Is we for, want plot. Well, yeah, as a reader, yeah. if I'm not getting plot, I'm not... I mean, I could admire the scene setting, mm. the beautiful turns of phrase, the characterization. I could admire all of that, but I'm not absorbed in a book unless I know why I'm reading yes, it. Yeah. And, and the reading is, I want to know what happens next. You need a question at the beginning of the book and you need an answer at the end yeah. of the book. Yeah. yeah. And not, not everything will be answered yeah. by the end, but the overall, yeah. you, don't, you need to be satisfied by the end of a book. I guess I'm talking about the quality of the writing. Well, and I yeah. hope that gets better. You know, I hope oh, that, definitely. that, you know, the more any of us write, uh, I, I and also, I suppose, in in holding, if I thought, you know, I, I was constantly deleting things. You know, if anything seemed to, seemed a bit, you know, if there was Flaring. any flight of fancy, yes. I would like there was a kind of self consciousness that kind of like I don't want people to think I've got, you know, no ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So delete. I think it you wasn't should like go with anything. Those. <laughs> I think you should go with those notions because you know, or go with those ideas because. God, I thought it really enhanced the writing. Like, let yourself, absolutely, because it, it really improved. Well, I suppose also with you, you need, I needed to change the writing in a way because the plot was different. Yeah, you it's know, very the, different. It, it, wasn't just a, it wasn't a whodunit or a what happened. There were kind of emotional things to be described yeah. and discussed. So, you know, you have to write about those things in a different yeah. way and find... Uh, a new vocabulary for yourself because I hadn't really explored that stuff before. It starts with a car crash. Six young people go off to the beach the day before. Two of them are to be married. But the events that lead up to the car crash have de devastating consequences, both for the families of the three people who don't survive and for the three survivors and all of their families. And the book... Um, like the, 
the person who was driving the car um, is forced to emigrate, forced to leave the town. And he experiences that homesickness. I left, I left Ireland when I was 17 and headed off to London. And um, I, you went to San Francisco, was it, at a very young age? Yeah, initially. I was 20, I think. 20, yeah. when yeah. you went to San Francisco. Did you experience that homesickness or did you immediately find your community? Because I, it's a lot about finding your community. It is. I didn't have any homesickness at all. Um, I was, what annoyed me was, and, it's, and, and you know, it's the difference between being 58 and being 20. Yeah. What annoyed me when I was 20 was, you know, you'd get away and you felt, oh, look at me, I'm all, I'm, I'm away now, I'm gone, I've left Ireland behind. And, and you'd make new friends and they were exciting, they were interesting, they were doing things. They're from all over the world, look at me with my new friends. And then you'd be at a party and you'd bump into someone you'd never met before from Ireland. And within sort of a minute, you kind of think, I know you better <laughs> than I know any of those other people. And I will always know you better. And you will know me better because, you know, we know what Wantley Wagon is. And, yes. and, and I think it's that. And you can <laughs> recite the green cost code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, it's, it's, and I think when you're a kid, that drives you crazy that you can't break the ties to home. You can't run away, you can't get away. Sure. And actually, as you get older, it's, it, that's a lovely feeling. It's a lovely feeling that when you bump into a strange Irish person at a party, that you have a rapport that you won't have with anyone else, and you will have that sense of shared experience and shared history. And I take great comfort in that now. Yeah. But back then, not at all. And the book raises uh, the reality of being gay in a, in a small town. And I know you've often joked about the fact that you, you felt different because you, you thought you felt different because you were a Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> but it must have been hard. Like, I hope by now there is a bar in Bandon called Gay Abandon. <laughs> and if not, why not? Why not? I don't really, I should um, open it. <laughs> but, it, like, was it... Uh, I mean, and you say your family were very accepting because you were a naturally flamboyant child, and so it wasn't a surprise to anybody. But I mean, did you, were you made to feel like an outsider in Bandon or later when you went to university, or? I don't think you're ever made to feel like an outsider. Like, no, yeah. it, it comes from you. Yeah. You feel other, and then, and because you are other. You know, I was this odd little boy. I was kind of a, a fae little boy uh, growing up. You know, the, the things that other boys were interested in, I wasn't interested in. Um, so that made school difficult. Oddly, I wasn't bullied. Mm. So I, did, I never had that experience. Um, I always had seemed to have some sort of, I mean, I was, a, I guess I was, I don't remember being funny, but I kind of remember being funny. So I think that was a, a protection. That was a good mm. way of, of, you know, keeping people at bay. Um, university, I remember loving when I got to university and really feeling like, oh, this is it. I found my tribe. You know, a lot, bunch of pretentious people who wear secondhand clothes and watch foreign films. This is, <laughs> this is fabulous. Um, and then... And that felt I'd come home. And the, but then when I, that first summer, I left, I went to, to London and Paris. And then when I came back to Cork, I, like, Cork just seemed like hell. Uh, so I really wanted out after, the, after two years at, at university, I wanted out. And so off I went, because of the J1 visa, off I went okay. to America. Okay, and San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah, and how did, I, like, how, how did, I mean, did you find your community immediately in San Francisco or did, did it take a while to settle in? Um, I found a community. I ended up uh, living in a hippie commune in San Francisco. Uh, and not because I had any aspirations to be a hippie. I was sort of an economic hippie because the rent was very cheap. Yeah. So I uh, rented a hostel room in the hippie commune and then I think another room came up and they had a meeting around the infinity table and they decided <laughs> that I could live there. And so I felt ter I felt like a sort of, you know, um, you know those people who, um, what do you call them? Uh, when they go undercover, when they go really deep. Yes, yeah. When they're in, in what are they, entrenched in, in something. Uh, incognito. In, not incognito. 
Embedded, yes. Embedded. I felt like I'd been embedded uh, some sort of thing in because I was so not of their world. You know, their concerns were not my concerns. Uh, but I literally was there because it was cheap. Um, and I and also once a week there was a chore wheel, and once a week I, I would have to cook the dinner. And like that must have been a, <laughs> such a depressing night for the hippies so when they when they looked at the chore wheel and went, he's cooking. And but then I remember I went back, there was an anniversary, some sort of 25th anniversary of the hippie commune, and I went back, and some of them were still there. And, and the ones that weren't there, this is, I love America for this, there's uh, now hippie retirement homes. Where no. they, yeah, where they're all still of a mind, they all, you know, they're still... It strikes me that you're too young to have been a hippie. Like, a hippie was, hippies were kind of a generation... Yes, I was Ahead too young. I was a, I was the youngest. You were baby hippie. Yeah, I was a baby hippie, okay. and they were in there. <laughs> but and then it was interesting. Some of the hippies had actual babies who were lived with us as well, but and they were way more. Uh, they were much worse than me in that I would pretend to play along with the hippie lifestyle. The kids were proper kind of radical. Uh, people in this hippie commune, in that they were embracing sort of commercialism, things that they would kill for a Barbie doll. They to not, rebel against yes. the... And, and, so, and you could see the hippies kind of looking at their child, going, no, we're not going to McDonald's. But that's all they wanted to do, of was do all the things that their friends did. So they were the really radical ones in the hippie commune. Um, uh, but so they weren't my tribe, but they looked after me because yeah. I was so... Clueless. <laughs> I went to America, and my parents knew I'd gone to America with 200 pounds. And I know it was 1983, but even then, 200 pounds, I thought that was enough for a month. I was going to have 50 pounds a week, and I thought, that's plenty. And, uh, <laughs> and my parents let me get on a plane, going, bye, <laughs> thinking that was... Our, um, it was not enough. <laughs> yes. I think I'd spent it after about 10 days, uh, which is why I needed the hippie call unit and a job. Yes, when I, when I left and headed for London, I spent my first week's salary on sweets. Like, that's how young I was. I was 17, and I spent my entire first week's salary on sweets and, and, and fags and a bottle of Malibu. You know, there you go. As you yeah. do, because I thought that will get me through the week. That's fine. Yeah, be fine. But uh, back to the book, Homestretch also charts the change in attitude of and to young gay men across two generations. Are you very proud of how far Ireland has come, like over that 20, 30 year stretch? Or do you think, you know, that we, we still have a way to go and we are clapping ourselves on the back way too soon? I think it's important to clap yourself on the back when things are achieved. Yes. You know, people can kind of, you know, be, be mealy bowed and kind of go, well, what about this? Oh, yeah, all right, we'll deal with that in a minute. Yeah. Let, for now, let's just celebrate this thing. This is great. Yeah. And, and when you say proud, I mean, I'm astonished more than anything else. You know, if anyone had said when I was leaving in 1983, oh, by the way... Gay in, marriage will be legal. Yeah, in, in your lifetime. 2015, I mean, I, yeah. I just wouldn't have... It just wouldn't, I couldn't have even denied it happening because it would have been like a science fiction movie or something. It just couldn't happen. So I think it's amazing. Um, and, you know, things aren't forever. So you do have to keep on top of all this stuff, as we've yeah. seen all around the world. Um, you know, I work, I do uh, Drag Race UK with RuPaul. And RuPaul's great. But RuPaul, like, watches the news and he sees kind of, the people protesting about stuff, and he goes, didn't we do this already? <laughs> and, and it's so true. There are so many things. You know, people are going on marches now for things like, didn't, I'm sure we had marches about this 30 years ago. <laughs> I'm sure we solved this. But no, no, we're still arguing about it. So I think that will, is something that would happen. But I do think in Ireland right now, it's a real sweet spot where young people are aware of how things have changed. I think there'll be a generation mm. being born now who are just thinking, well, of course this is how it is. You know, why wouldn't I have these rights? Because I'm alive and I want to do that. So, of course, someone's going to let me. Um, but I think there's a generation at the moment that get it, that know they're very lucky and mm. they know how brilliant it is. And I think when uh, there's 
there's just a particular kind of age group that you talk to who are genuinely proud of Ireland and proud of the country they live in. And it's lovely to see. Um, but like, you know, but as you say, it's not going to last forever. No, <laughs> in about five years, it'll it, be, yeah. I know, we'll be back, back to, you know, fighting for the rights of, I don't know, whatever, travellers' rights or trans rights or, you know, it's, it's, it's not over. It's an, it's an ever-involving yeah. state of affairs. Yes. The sun comes in, the sun goes out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I also want to talk to you about the way you write women because you capture women so brilliantly. And in Homestretch, the protagonist sister, Ellen, is trapped in this loveless marriage, which is so... Um, typical of, I think, the 70s, 80s, 90s, in our, and before, where there was no divorce, there was no contraception, rape within marriage was not illegal. So women were often trapped in really horrific situations. But you capture that so brilliantly, and you wrote her so intelligently. Um, did, you, did you talk to your women friends, or do you just have a natural affinity towards towards the writing of women? Um, I, I hope I have a natural affinity to the writing of women. Um, I think women are more interesting to write. It's interesting that you write so many men. Yeah. Because I think... I think they're easier because they're simpler. No, no, they are. Yeah. <laughs> no, they are. They are. I mean, I think the way women have to navigate the world is always going to be much more nuanced than the way... You know, men can be much more bull in a china shop about everything because they just can. Um, yeah. Whereas you, 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 you know, I, you see women in relationships, you see women in situations at work where they have to navigate the world in a really more complicated way than any man. And and also, women's needs, I think, are more interesting than men's needs because often women's needs aren't about what they need. It's yes. about how they can fix other people or help other people. The negotiation. And that's, that's yeah. filling a need in them. Um, so I do find women more interesting. Um, and yeah, men are quite, <laughs> as you say, they're quite straightforward. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I always talk about, um, you know, if I'm having a row with my husband, he doesn't know that I'm having a row because he, he says, are you okay? And I say, yeah, I'm fine. And he thinks I'm fine. <laughs> More Richard. And, you know, obviously I'm not fine. But because I've said he's fine, because when he says he's fine, he actually is fine. <laughs> you know? but, he wasn't fine, he'd tell yeah, you. Yes, exactly. But um, so did you know that you were writing feminist noir at the same time in this book? <laughs> Uh, there is a touch of that. I mean, there certainly the female characters are so well fresh out. Even the one who ends up in the in a wheelchair, one of the characters ends up in a wheelchair, and you've written her so sympathetically and so um, empathetically. You know, I just kind of think you you you've tapped into the female characters. I hope. I mean, that way. I was kind of nervous of that because you know. It, because we all we all have to be now nervous of writing anything that is outside of course our, ourselves. Um, I think that's kind of gone away a bit. I think it, there was it kind of flared up and it's kind of calmed down now. Calm down, everybody. We're good. They're books. They're books. Um, but but equally, I think you do have a responsibility when you're writing any character to to make them as you know, fully formed or as fleshed out as you can. You know, you don't want to have a twirling moustache baddie. You want to have a baddie who is a baddie for a reason and has other qualities besides that. Um, you know, unless, I mean, there are certain sort of books where you actually you just need, you know, if, if it's a James Bond novel, no. <laughs> you just, you want a doctor, no. Um, but but in, I think in, in most fiction, uh, people need to be as fully formed as possible because you're spending so much time with them. It's not like a movie where there's a scene and they're gone. Da, da, da. It's, you know, it's you and that book in that world, those characters, and you're there for a long time. It's hours of your life. Absolutely. So they've got to live. 
Yes, and you've, you've, you're internalizing every character's and every character's emotions. Yeah. And I have to congratulate you on the, the ending of the novel, the face-off between the protagonist and the antagonist at the end is so unexpected and so subtly done and so brilliantly done. I'm not going to spoil it, but when you get to the end and you're expecting this, it goes into a sideways... I don't know how to describe it. It's perfect. It well, is it was, absolutely perfect. It was very hard, that end. And I kept thinking of what the story needed. And I kept thinking in terms of revenge and punishment. Those were the, those yeah. were the things that I thought, as a reader, you're going to want that. Okay. And, and every idea I came up with just felt wrong. And then... When I it finally had a eureka moment about what that ending would be, and I, I just thought that, that it was once I'd had the idea, it was obvious that was the only ending that was possible. It was the it was only perfect. ending there was, um, and it felt, yeah, I was I was really pleased. It with felt that right. Yeah. It felt appropriate for all of the characters. Yeah. The, like the the motivations, like. If, there, if it had ended in a different way, it wouldn't have been true to Connor's character. Yes, you know, exactly. It was perfect. Yeah. It was yeah. perfect. Oh, thank you. Thank oh. you very much. Sure, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm going to ask you about writing in, in, in general. We spoke briefly on the phone. You're, um, uh, you're working on your fourth <laughs> novel. And we talked about COVID. And we said, you know, are we going to put COVID in our novels? It's so hard to know. I just, I read one uh, yesterday, and it's the first novel I've read that's entirely set in COVID. It starts in January 2020, and it goes right to the end of the year. And it's, it's tricky. I mean, yeah. I'm, I didn't, I mean, I enjoyed lots of the book. I didn't really enjoy reliving that year. Mm. Um, so I I. And I've read other books that kind of reference it as if it's over. And, mm. But the books are out already. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you miscalculated there, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> not quite done. Uh, we're sat in a tent. Uh, but <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I, so I, I don't know yet. I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm not even a quarter of the way through the book. So, so far, I haven't mentioned it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yet it is sort of happening now. I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm being a bit mealy mouthed about it. Whereas I, I was saying to you, there are bits of it I kind of think actually be quite useful because it is quite a good plot device for some things. You know, if some things are shot, or if you can't visit somebody, it, it's. It there, do- there is a book uh, called Fifty Six Days by Catherine Ryan Howard, who is a writer from Cork, uh, which is coming out shortly, and it's set. It's set in the first 56 days of the first lockdown. But it's, that's just the backdrop to the yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Nobody gets sick and nobody is in hospital. It's just a device to force this new, relatively new couple into deciding whether they're going to stay apart for 56 days or whether they're going to move in together. And nothing is what it seems. But it's very clever. That does sound clever. Yeah. 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 I wish I'd thought of that. Yeah. Because what yeah. it has, I mean, because I think what it did to a lots of relationships is, yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, it just kind of, it was like putting them in a, 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 a kind of hothouse of, you know, either it was going to kill them <laughs> or they were going to flourish. <laughs> yeah. I kind of thought, I, th- I kind of thought it would be possible to use it in that, you know, somebody's having an affair, but they say they have to self isolate. So they're self-isolating with their mistress. So, you know, there's lots of ways where you could use it, but I'm just not touching it. I'm not touching it. I just don't think... Yes. Because it's not over yet, and we don't know how bad it's going to get. And also, I suppose it's one of those things, it'll be more useful, I think, as a storyteller, when it is in the past. Yeah. You can, you know, you could be quite a good starting point. I like that, you know, where a relationship started in something like now or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think it might be more useful in the future. But for now, it just seems too, as you say, just messy and undefined. Mm. It tips, yeah. We don't know where it's going. Yeah. Do you write in London or do you only write when you're home? Uh, no, I'll write wherever. Uh, 
you know, I've got a laptop and the way, you know, I should be writing. Like now, I, you know, I got back kind of end of May, beginning of June, so I should have written loads. I've written hardly any uh, while I've been back. I've just been staring at a window. And, uh, and that was very nice too. Um, and, but it means that, you know, as the year goes on, I'm going to have to get much more disciplined about writing. And that means if I've got a day free wherever I am, I've got to open up that laptop and just and, and get into it. And you've never, even though you spent more than half your life now in London, you've never set a you've never set a novel in England. They're always set in Ireland. Yeah, and I did. Why a, is that? Well, I did a uh, an event in Dublin, uh, I think for a keeper, and someone in the Q and A said, "Oh, you know, why do you set your books in Ireland?" And and I, I thought that's you know. I don't know. And then I was, as I was answering the question, it suddenly dawned on me. I said, the book's in Ireland because I don't know England in that way. It's like yeah. I go back to earlier, you know, when you bump into the Irish person at the party, you know them. There's a connection. I don't know what an English person's kitchen looks like. I mean, my, <laughs> you know, my world is so specific. It's so London-based and, and just, you know, it's a... I, worked in restaurants and then I worked in radio and TV and stand up. I mean, it's yeah. a really specific world I inhabit and not particularly useful for a book. Uh, you know, I couldn't, the sort of stories I tell about Ireland, certainly, I couldn't tell about England. You know, I don't know how English people talk to each other when I'm not there. You know what I mean? I know, like I, I don't, know, yeah. I, I can't eavesdrop on that conversation because I don't know what it is. I, I mean, I don't even know that many English people, really, when I think about it. You know, most of my friends are from somewhere else. Yeah, I found when I lived in London, I, like, my friends were Scottish, Jamaican, you know, none of them were actually English. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? You it know very, very few English people, yeah. yeah. I don't know where they are. Well, <laughs> well, I think they're in the rest of England. I don't think they're in London. The rest of London England's is full of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> full of them. <laughs> That's so true. So let's go back to Little Graham. I know your sister is a librarian. Is, 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 was it libraries where you first discovered books or was your home full of books as a child? Uh, my mother read a bit. I mean, she, she does read, she reads a lot. But uh, back then, I think, you know, she was busy with two kids and I don't think she read that much. Uh, it was really my sister got into reading. She's four years older than me. So she was the one who brought books into the house and she was the one who made that seem like, you know, a, an aspirational thing to do, you know, was part, you, I saw my sister reading books, so I wanted to read books. That was a thing. Um, so like so many people started with uh, Enid Blight and all of that sort of stuff. And I remember there was a, the, the library in Bandon then, I think it was Mrs. Nagel ran the library in Bandon and it was tiny. It was so small and it was sort of, uh, it was two kind of aisles with shelves and things. And I, and you know, you finish with the children's section really early. Yeah. And then I used to kind of borrow, I used to get my mother to borrow me books from kind of the more adult section and stuff like that. So that's kind of uh, my relationship with libraries then. Um, and then I read an awful lot through school and through university. And then I feel like in my uh, kind of early 20s, my mid 20s to mid 30s, I feel like I didn't read anything. I feel really? like I, yeah, I really just didn't read. We were talking about Armistead Mopan the other day. I mean, I, I presume you read all of the Tales of the City books yeah. when they came out. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, I started reading him. Uh, I discovered him when I was in San Francisco in the hippie commune because oh, wow. they were in the newspaper as newspaper columns. That's you know, right. In that kind of Dick Charles Dickens thing, that. you would have a, just a little, a little chapter every day. Um, and what's amazing about him and plot is he didn't plan those books. He would literally write the, he would write the 500 words and send it in. And then he goes, oh, better do tomorrow's. And then, and yes, when you read, when they, when he puts them all together. So he didn't know who Anna Madrigal was? From I don't think he did. That's I don't think he did. extraordinary. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so was there any book in, in school that you were, that you studied, or even a play in school that you studied that, 
that you know struck you or not, I, I remember uh, he's now a friend of mine, Niall McMonagall. He was a, oh, a yeah. he was a supply teacher when uh, other English teachers were there. And he was great because he would just bring in like carrier bags of books and just you'd throw them at us, and you you would go and read these. But you basically he like, he was would bring carrier books. Carry bags. Go. To, these are all good books. The book whisperer. Yeah. So these yeah. are all good books. Uh, read one. Boom, boom, boom. And I remember I got the bell jar. Oh yeah. Um, from him, and th- that just being ama- amazing to me. That book. That that voice. I'd never read that voice before. Of course. Um, and loving that book. It really opened up. Uh, so many things to me, just about being young and navigating the world and all, all of it. There was something quite reductive written in a, a review of, um, something quite reductive written about Sylvia Plath just yesterday in, in one of the newspapers, referring to her as Ted Hughes' wife. You know, that kind of thing, that again, you know, not giving her her, yeah. her, her due recognition and acknowledgement of the incredible writer yeah. and poet that she so that was. that book, yeah, I feel yeah. like every young push person should read that book. So, uh, what is the best book you have ever read? I'll give you three, because I know it's impossible to say one. Um, d- 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 I, rem- I mean, it's, it is a, it's a big, you have to decide to do it, but Middlemarch... Oh, yeah. Everything's in Middlemarch. There's nothing, yeah. there's, I mean, I'm sure not everyone's in Middlemarch, but, but every, emo- I feel like every emotion there's is a in world there. Middlemarch and brilliantly described. God, I haven't um, read that in so many years. So uh, that would be one. Um, what else have I loved? Um, there's a book, I talk about this book all the time, uh, Mary Lawson, The Other Side of the Bridge. Have you read her? No. Mary Lawson, she's Canadian, lives in London. She's got a new one out now called uh, uh, A Town Called Solace. Uh, it's just out. Okay. Uh, it's her, and it's her fourth novel. She doesn't churn them out. <laughs> she's a bit slow at the old tippy-tappy typing. But, uh, <laughs> but they are very good. Um, what else have I loved? Uh, there's a book of short stories by Laurie Moore, Self Help. Oh, yes, I've heard about these. So good. Again, I mean, I haven't read that in a thousand years, but when I was kind of early 20s, I loved that book. I thought it was hilarious and wise, just great. Okay. Yeah, really, really good. No, oh, well, that's, uh, that's something that we're all going to take notes on and read those afterwards. Was there ever a book that you put in the bin? No. Really? No. Really? Never? No. Uh... I mean, there's, you know, there are books you think are not very good. Mm. Uh, I am a finisher. Like, I, if I start a book, if I get in, into it at all, I will finish it. Um, I may not read every page, but, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I will uh, finish it. My mother has a thing where my mother reads the ends of books first to see, to see if it's going to be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> She's 89. Time is precious. <laughs> and now, you, you, now on, your, on your radio show in particular, you get to talk to all of your favourite writers and, you know, um, international writers. And without naming names, have you ever been disappointed um, by a writer that you've interviewed? Not, no, because I think... I mean, if you... I find if I like a book... That's enough for me. If yeah. I meet the person, yeah. I mean, you know, unless they spit on me or something, then, uh, you know, if they're boring or if they're, you know, if they're not as great as you wanted them to be, sure. I don't judge them for that. Because actually, I always think, you know, it's nobody's job to be a good guest. You know, they've done the job. They've done the thing they, they claim to be good at and that was write a brilliant book. If they're not very entertaining on a radio show or a TV show, I mean, that's a shame for the audience. Yeah. But I don't think any less of them. Of course. Because I think, there were, you know, the, the days of those amazing, you know, the Peter Ustinoffs and the David Nivens, and, oh, you know, those yeah. kind of raconteurs who were almost professional chat show guests, that's kind of gone. I um, mean, you still get people who are very good guests, but I, but people who are bad at it, I kind of think, God love you. 
Because <laughs> now it must be so difficult. Yeah, you know, part- writing a book is so hard and it suits... You know, you, you meet people and you kind of think, oh, I, I see why you became a writer. <laughs> because, yeah, hanging out with others is not for you. Uh, but, but then they are poked with a stick and made yeah. to go out and do things like this, which must be a hell. I know. I know so many writers who, who you know, suffer from social anxiety. And the idea of doing something like this would just, you know, have them in knots for days and they'd be Xanaxed <laughs> to the <laughs> And I've interviewed some writers who are Xanax to the hilt, and, it, it, you know, it is quite torturous. Yeah. But, you know, they, they, they do their best, and it's, it's not their fault. It's just not their thing, you yeah. know. Yeah, and actually, at least they're being forced to do it. The ones that have annoyed me are the actors. You know, those actors kind of go, oh, I get so nervous, I vomit in the wings, and <laughs> I'm just do something else. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? If, if you were afraid of buses, you wouldn't become a bus driver. <laughs> Uh, I just, yeah, that, I have no patience. No patience for those actors. Whereas poor writers, I kind of, I do have sympathy for them. Because this isn't, you know, they didn't want the bright lights. They didn't no. want the people in rows. They wanted to be alone in a room. Okay, I'm going to just ask you a quick few last questions. Uh, what, what is the book that you would thrust into the hands of, of every... Um, young person before the age of 18 and say, you must read this? Um, I mean, I do... Is I, there? I mean, I do think... For me, it, it would be The Bell Jar. But I think for every kid, it's going to be a different book. Yeah. I think... That's what's kind of... I think that's kind of what's brilliant about books is that they unlock different things for you at different times. That's a very like, good point. I read... Um, uh, we were talking about him earlier. Brandon Tyler, I think. He was nominated for the Booker last year with a book called Real Life. And and it was... I read it. I was so... I, I, because I was reading it and the whole George Floyd uh, thing was going on at the time. And this book, I thought, was just brilliant. Because normally when you think about, you know, racism, and normally if racism is in a book, it's a sort of, you know... To Kill a Mockingbird sort of racism. It's a big, it's the dramatic issue of the thing. Book. Yeah. And what's interesting about his book is it's all, it's kind of, you know, death by a thousand cuts. It's that, it's just that the, the everyday. endless, every day, mm. every situation just is race plays a part in it. And I thought to myself, wow, I've never read this before. I've never read anything like that before. And then I do a book club on Audible and Sadie Smith's on Beauty was in it. And I'd read that book and really enjoyed it. I think yeah. it's a, my favourite book of hers. Uh, but for the book club, I reread it. And it's the Brandon Tyler thing. It's, it, she describes that racism ex- in exactly the same way. And I'd missed it. I did not see that the first... I, don't, I didn't even remember racism being in that book. I just thought it was a story about families and affairs and marriages falling apart and da-da-da. And I... It just wasn't in my consciousness. Of course. Whereas last summer, it totally was in my consciousness. Yeah. And that's what I saw in that book. I think, yeah, I think the issues, the issues are so to the forefront of our minds now. Yeah. Um, that we, we are more aware when race is, yeah. you know, there's a, a couple of books I've re- read recently, you know, that have just been written in the last four or five years. There's one called Sing Unburied Sing by Jasmine Wilde. And it's just about this black family. And... Racism is just the subtle, everyday tone. And it's yeah. just, it's not written, like, it's not written in order to be a book about race. It's just this, these characters' experiences. Yeah. And it's just, it's shocking when you read it as a white person and you realise how, how difficult it must be to be black the all living day, in the America. The all-day, everyday yeah. of it, yeah. yeah. But also, yeah. going back to that thing of, I don't you find it like rereading a book? I love rereading a book because, particularly something you read when you're really young, you'll go, oh, oh, that's what this book is about. <laughs> like I remember seeing a movie called The Night They Raided Minsky's, and I think it was one of the, well, I think my sister was supposed to be babysitting me, but she wasn't really because we hated each other. So, um, so she was in her room and I was watching telly, and this movie. Uh, was on, The Night the Radio Minsky's. And I remember I ended up sobbing. I found it was so sad, this film. Really broke my heart. 
it's like a comedy. It's a romp. <laughs> but I so misunderstood it as a as a kid. I I just thought it was a, a terrible. Uh, I can't remember what it's about. It's about a burlesque performer or something. Uh, but I just thought it was heartbreaking. This film. No comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be because we're running out of time now. We better open it up. Who has the roving mic? Who has the clean mic? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and who wants to be the first victim to ask a question? Oh, there's no questions. We We're can go here. now. Bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> oh, no, there's one. There's there is one. one. Oh, you there. as soon as there's one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so it's a silly question. In the introduction, um, you described Graham as an Irish dancer, which made it sound like it was current. Are you still dancing, Graham? <laughs> I still dance. Not when I mean, it's Irish dancing, I because I'm, I'm Irish and it's in Ireland. Uh, but uh, just in my kitchen and uh, no steps. There are no actual steps. I was referring to his starring role in Father Ted <laughs> in the car. <laughs> yeah. Where I just, I just channeled Michael Flatley, really. Just with See, I worked on Riverdance for three years as a stage manager. Oh, so wow. <laughs> yes. Were you doing it when uh, Mr. Flatley was in no, it? No, 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 no. He oh. was only in it for five minutes. Oh, right. And then he, Hence, he, he can still walk. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no, he, he left before it actually went on tour. Oh, did he? Yes, yeah. He, he, Quitter. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's why I threw in the Irish dance thing, just because of that little, the most memorable, it's the most memorable part of Father Ted for me. Like, I, don't, I remember that scene more than I remember anything that Ted or Dougal ever yeah. said or did. That episode, the, car, the caravan episode is a really it's a good, good episode. episode. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of plot in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another question, please. Oh, there's a lady inside there. In the book, you know, the, the whole, the beginning with, with the accident, um, there's been quite a few very tragic accidents in yeah, West Yeah, Killarney. Yeah. And was that kind of... It was, that is kind of what, what sparked the idea in my head was, it was actually, uh, it was in a restaurant and a... Uh, a waitress was looking for sponsorship uh, for uh, someone because they were trying to put ramps into a house and uh, she was telling me about this terrible accident and she, I think I must have, I think I asked about the driver and the driver had survived and then I started noticing in lots of the news stories because as you say, particularly in the summer it seems, these things happen and it's that kind of recklessness of youth, that kind of confidence of nothing can happen to us and of course, Terrible things do happen. And uh, I started noticing that often the driver survived. And so that was kind of the germ, the beginning of this book, which turned into something else. But it was what happens to that young life. You know, you haven't, you've, you're hardly an adult. You've hardly begun your adult life. And this terrible thing has happened. How do you continue? How do you go on with your life? And I kept thinking about that, and I think, is that a book? I don't know if that's a book. And then I came up with kind of a kind of a, a plot twist for the middle of the book, and I kind of well, actually, yeah, I, I can. This it can turn into the journey of a life, and and, and be uh, a novel. But yeah, you're right. That is where absolutely where it came from. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Oh, there's a lady at the back there now. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, you know, because of the work on TV and radio that you do, and you're, you know, constantly interviewing people, and you know, I suppose as a viewer asking the questions we all want answered, does that put added pressure on you when you are writing to say, oh, I have to fulfil so many things here? Or is, that, is that something that you struggle with? Uh, no, I think when I'm writing, uh, I'm just trying to. I mean, I, you're aware of a reader, you know. You know, you're not stupid. You do, you do, you do know this book will come, uh, sort of blinking into the light. Uh, but I think, as you're writing it, you're kind of trying to please yourself. You're, kind, you know, you're asking the questions. You're going, does this work? Have I got this right? You come back to it, and I, that's the bit I kind of like. The, you know, you coming back to a scene, kind of, oh no, actually that's too short. There needs this, this this scene needs more room, or you come back and you kind of think, actually, this doesn't work at all, or there's no need for this scene. Those are the, the things I like, uh, where you're asking yourself the questions. And I don't really, yeah, certainly when I'm doing books, I'd ever think about 
this bit. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't think. I mean, I, I, I. Again, not stupid. I do know this bit will happen, but um, usually. But uh, but it's not kind of at the forefront of my mind. It's yeah. often, uh, you know, after the book co comes out, that people tell you what the book was about because you actually don't know yourself yeah. when you're writing it. Yeah, it's often it's really interesting to know what it's about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're right, yes it is. <laughs> that's, you're, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was writing about. <laughs> okay, I think we are done. Thank you uh, again to Emer and everybody at West Cork Literature Fest. Thank you to our camera crew, our sound technicians, and to all of you for coming. It's been a, a real thrill and a privilege for me, obviously. And well, thank you so thank much, Liz. Thank you, Greg. No, thank you, Liz. <laughs> we're going to have a photo taken now. <laughs> thank you very much.